This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 8th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss how the fiscal battle this coming regular session over the anticipated excess oil revenues is shaping up. Second, we take a way too early look at the impact of redistricting on Alaska fiscal issues. And third, we discuss some good news about the PICA project. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into this, Brad. Um, First things first, last week we talked about the Department of Revenue forecast, and you've had a chance to uh, scratch into this and get a little more info, take a little more time, uh, and you want to dive into that first. So let's uh, let's start there, shall we? Uh, Yeah. Uh, So last week we were having a discussion. I was talking about the preliminary fall forecast that the administration had come out with, um, and I was saying that it gave us, because it recognized higher oil prices, uh, that are currently in the market, that it gave us uh, uh, some hope uh, for a supplemental PFD, that it gave some room, some scope uh, for uh, for a supplemental PFD. Uh, and I was uh, I, I went on at some length about that. You ask a question uh, that I that I don't think I really treated with the seriousness and respect I should have at the time. You said, "Well, won't legislators just look that look at that as a pot of money?" Uh, legislators and lobbyists look at that as a pot of money to be spent right. uh, on other things. As Which has been my, spent on the- that's been my problem the whole time. Anytime we talk about new revenues or anything else, I mean, that's the first thing I think is, I mean, they're not going to give it to us. They're not going to spend it on what they should be spending it on. They're going to find new programs. That's always been my concern. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, following up on that, uh, in the next, in the ne- in the subsequent uh, few days, there were two articles, at least two in the, in the, in the papers one an editorial, an op-ed in the uh, a guest op-ed in the ADN, and the other an interview with Adam Wool in the Fairbanks News Miner that proved exactly your point. Uh, the op-ed in the ADN was written by Nils Andreasen, the, the executive director of the Alaska Municipal League, and it has this paragraph: uh, "We can consider this increased revenue as a back-to-baseline approach. It provides the state with the revenue it brings it needs." to bring its budget, unrestricted general fund spending specifically, back to baseline consistent with its responsibilities. That means that the state can afford fully to pay for commitments like oil tax credits and school bond reimbursement, fully capitalize community assistance and reimburse communities for harbor, uh, for harbor debt, provide an adequate level of funding for school construction and major maintenance grant and matching bonds programs. It means the state can inflation adjust to base student allocation for education, attract and retain public safety officers and teachers, reinstitute full funding for the university system and increase funding for public health care, uh, uh, child care assistance, the Alaska Marine Highway System, road and airport maintenance and matching grants for water and sewer projects. After that, there's a paragraph that talks a little bit about the PFD. <laughs> but but the but but the entire discussion in the op-ed is yep. about spending it on other things. And yep. then, as if to emphasize the point, in a uh, in an interview with uh, the Fairbanks News Miner about uh, the higher revenues forecast in the fall uh, in the uh, in the preliminary fall revenue forecast from Department of Revenue, uh, uh, the Linda Hersey, the uh, uh, the Fairbanks News Miner uh, reporter, asked Adam about uh, the increased revenues and whether they uh, would result in higher PFDs. And Adam said, 
As for a supplemental PFD, if we have surplus monies, they should either be put in savings, since we've drained most of those accounts, or used for things that have been neglected. He identified spending needs for ferries, school debt reimbursement, and community assistance programs. So as we go into the next session, the next session, uh, the regular session next January, uh, we will have a windfall uh, if oil prices hold up. Uh, we will have, and, and the futures market tells us they're going to through, uh, through the end of this fiscal year. If oil prices hold up, we will have additional revenues. Uh, but but instead of the governor's approach of using that for a supplemental PFD and, and a coming current, at least a POMV 5050, uh, there are those people out there in the world who have m much different things in mind for the uh, for the additional revenue. Well, this and that's 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 really going to define that's really going to define, I think, uh, what we go into uh, next regular session. I mean, isn't this isn't this what Hammond talked about, Brad? I mean, in diapering the devil and in and all his other writings and works, especially around the the creation of the permanent fund dividend, isn't this what he talked about? That basically this was that uh, I can't this Parkinson's principles where all your all your available time is filled up with work or whatever. It's the same thing with all the available money is then sucked up by government to pay for whatever it is that they want to pay, not the things that they should pay, but oh now now we need to re increase the the university and now we need to give student debt and now we need to do. I mean, they'll always find other things to spend the money on. That's always been my concern. I know we've needed to talk about taxation just because we want to get ahead of the power curve. We don't want to get slammed with something. But my fear has always been if you give them more money, they will just spend it because that's that's what they've been doing for the last 50 years. Well, and I think that's why the bipartisan uh, fiscal policy working group uh, suggested a spending cap and suggested a uh, uh, constitutionalizing the PFD so that you forced, I mean, Hammond's principle was force them to go to taxes, force them to use taxes to raise additional revenues. And that's the point at which all Alaskans will push back on spending and say, no, the problem with, with problem with using PFD cuts is that you shove the burden of middle and lower income Alaskan families, families, uh, and the top 20% don't participate. And as a result, don't shove back uh, on spending. So that's why that's why Hammond said, make certain that all of the excess revenues uh, that you need uh, uh, come from taxes so that that you have that stranglehold uh, on on legislators. And we haven't done that. I mean, we 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 we, we have legislators who resist taxes uh, for uh, for the additional revenues. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, leave the door open. Uh, uh, those who 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 want to avoid taxes, uh, go to the, go to use PFD cuts to do it. Brad Keith Lee, Alaskans for sustainable budgets is our guest. Um, I mean, I don't know, you know, I think that's the solution though. I mean, you just laid it out. I mean, we have to have a spending cap so that they can't continue to overspend. Let's face it. If we look back during the Parnell years and, uh, you know, that was really the genesis of the spending from the SBR and the CBR. And that's really where the 18 billion started to drain out of those accounts. If we mm -hmm. had had a, a solid, a lock solid spending cap, especially in those high cotton years, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in right now. And so a spending cap really has got to be one of the primary things that has to be discussed. Well, keep in mind, Michael, that we have a spending cap. There's a there's well, a spending cap in the constitution. An effective the, the, spending the, cap, I guess I should the say. The prob the problem the problem is it's too high. And the problem with any spending cap is it may ultimately become too high. That revenues, current revenues, may may drive below that spending cap. So again, that's why Hammond talked about, you know, having uh, 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 taxes as the only source, as the only way to be able to increase revenues, so that if you if you wanted to increase revenues to cover uh, even inside the spending cap, if you wanted to increase revenues to cover uh, uh, additional spending, you had to do it through taxes and 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 activate uh, the population to uh, to oppose it. Uh, I mean, a Hammond had this figured out, uh, and uh, and 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 the problem with this generation, uh, frankly, uh, the post Hammond generation, is that we take some of his some of his guidance, but we don't take all of it. We're selective in how we do it. Right. Um, and I, uh, and I, and I think that's, that's our failing. One other thing on, on the, on the fiscal plan that I think uh, is important to mention uh, as we come into the next regular session, the governor did uh, department of revenue did 
uh, publish uh, uh, a fiscal model. We talked about it some last week. Uh, I've had time to uh, uh, this week to uh, to play around with it. It's got some good uh, pieces uh, with, of it. For those who haven't used it, you can go to the Department of Revenue re uh, web website uh, on the front page of the Department of Revenue website. It says fiscal model. Click on that. You need to be able to use, uh, you need to have access to Excel uh, uh, on, a, on a window system because you have to enable macros. But uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that. It's, it's a good thing to do with. There are some peculiar things about it. Uh, that are that are barriers and make it less uh, than fully useful. One is you can't vary oil prices by year, um, as the as the futures market does tells us it, it's going to vary by year. You can vary PFDs by year. You can go in and and have different PFD cuts by year, but you can't vary oil prices by year. You can't uh, change uh, uh, production levels and. Uh, and there are some that believe we're going to have higher production. There are some that believe we're going to have lower production uh, over the uh, over the entire period. Um, on the spending side, uh, there are there are very useful boxes uh, that give you the ability to go into the uh, 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 categories of spending: uh, public safety, Department of Natural Resources, Department of Law, and make reductions in those. Uh, but one one challenge with it is it also gives you the ability to just say, well, I want to cut spending by 25 percent. Um, and and, and, the, and the problem with that is it doesn't result in the user having to go through the hard choices that the legislature has to go through to make spending cuts. So the user isn't getting the experience that legislators go through and say, well, I'm going to cut department and I'm going to to cut corrections, for example, by 15%, because that's a big spending category. Right. I'm going to cut corrections by 15%. And so users aren't getting the legislative experience. It's not, it's not really preparing users to understand what legislators are going through um, as the as they confront these issues. And then the final two things is it doesn't have a module uh, to tell you what the distributional effect is, to tell you who pays under the various alternatives. Um, even using PFD cuts to balance the budget, and it doesn't have an economic impact model module, so you can't see what the economic impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, is. It's useful to to play around with a little bit, but uh, has some definite failings that I think uh, are going to make it less than useful in helping constituents understand what legislators are going through uh, next session. I appreciate Brad, your you know the the uh, your commentary that. Uh, you didn't give that question the the gravitas that it deserved, only because I've seen, I mean, I've seen the, the 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 track record. I've seen the handwriting on the wall. This is what they always do, and it's just, it's so astonishing to watch them say, "We're crisis, we're crisis." Oh no, we're flush now. Let's do whatever we want. Oh, we're crisis, we're crisis. Oh no, we're flush now. Do I mean this is a cyclical thing that we've seen in the state? I mean, I don't know what four, five, six times just in my political lifetime of watching this stuff. Uh, you know, we, we run from one side of the ship to the other. Here's the difference. And and here's, in my defense, here's why I didn't leap to that uh, uh, last, uh, last uh, discussion. We have never been in a situation where we've cut the PFD, cut the PFD from statutory levels. Um, and then uh, it, because we're, because we're in one of the, one of the down cycles and then come out of that cycle. Um all the other times we've 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 gone through exactly what you uh, what you mentioned. We kept the PFD. Every a lot of other things went, a lot of other spending went, but we kept the PFD through all those cycles. So I, I mean, my re my reaction was okay. The PFD is the third rail. Uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna have a revenue stream where we don't have to cut the PFD in order to support the funding, the levels of funding that the legislature itself said. Last spring was sufficient for FY22. We don't have to cut the PFD to do that because we have these excess revenues. And so the excess revenues should go to the PFD, should restore the PFD. Um, and I and, and to be honest, you know, I, I, I was pleased to see the governor take that position. Um, uh, but I was just shocked. I, I, frankly, I was shocked when I when I read Nils's uh, uh, op-ed that went through that long laundry list of everything else that needs to be funded before we finally get down uh, to the to the PFD paragraph, and even in the PFD paragraph, he doesn't he doesn't argue for restoring the PFD. It's just sort of yeah, we need to deal with the PFD along with these other things. 
So it's 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 different from the previous cycles uh, uh, in that we never cut the PFD and 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 face the question of restoring it when we came out of one of those cycles. You know, and that's that's what really kills me is that these politicians who supposedly are representing us in the biggest way, and I understand that they you know that they they have all these pet projects and programs and things that they believe will make life and society better and everything else. But they all fail to take a look again, not only at the distributional aspect of whatever modeling they're putting out there and everything else, but just at the fact that here we are going almost two years now into a pandemic. We've seen the economy just crater, trying to come out of a recession to begin with right before the pandemic hits. And people are struggling uh, and they continue to tap into the permanent fund and they continue to just not even acknowledge the fact that this money, if they paid the full PFD, forget about the back PFD, even if they just paid the full PFD, what the effect would be on the economy and how much it would help everything else. It's the rising tide floating all boats scenario. Yeah, and it's because, Michael, part of that, I think, is because they don't do the additional modeling of looking at the distrib- distributional impacts. And it, 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 they may do it in the back room. In fact, I'm, in fact, I'm fairly confident they do do it in the back room. They just don't want the public to see the additional, the additional modeling that tells them who is paying, what Alaskans, which Alaskans fam- Alaskan families are paying as a result of PFD cuts, and what the economic, the overall economic impact is. They're, they're, they're not confronting those two realities. It is it is the lobbyists uh, who have got to them uh, that say, you've got to spend on this, you've got to spend on this, you've got to spend on that. Um, and it's the top 20% who are, who are agnostic saying, we don't care because we don't have to pay any part of it. Um, uh, keep going, keep going. Don't, don't, don't bother us. Um, and, and the combination of those two things are, 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 are driving, uh, uh, you know, the continual focus on, uh, on government spending levels. If they, if, if they had to go public with, in my view, if they had to go public with the distributional impact and show who's paying, what Alaska families are paying, what Alaska families aren't, uh, for uh, uh, for government as a result of using PFD cuts, and they had to go public with the uh, with the economic impact modeling. Uh, I think uh, I think things would be different because people would see uh, uh, what that impact what that impact is. You know what the most shocking thing of that is to me is that the Democrats again, who proportional you know pr- purportedly are for all for their people and they're representing the lower incomes and I mean all this kind of stuff that they should be the ones that we would think would be shouting from the rooftops that we need to protect the PFD, especially rural Democrats. And yet they all just kind of roll over and say, whatever, 30 seconds. Yeah, it's this, it's this it's unholy alliance between the top 20% and the Democrats. The Democrats are saying, don't, don't challenge our funding. And the top 20% are saying, okay, don't make us pay for it. Use PFD cuts to pay for it. And it's this standoff, this unholy alliance between the two of them that's gotten us where we are. I mean, that's why Hammond said, use income taxes to force the top 20% to confront spending. And then they'll push back on spending. All right, Brad, that's number one. Number two, we're going to talk a little bit about redistricting. Give us a tease here before we go to break. So uh, the the redistricting board has done the House districts. Uh, I think they tell us something about uh, where we're headed on fiscal policy, frankly. Uh, I, I When I sent this to you, I said it, this is the way too early look at the impact of redistricting on uh, fiscal policy. But I think there are some things it tells us, uh, and we're going to we're going to talk about those. All right. Continuing now, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest for today. We're talking about the weekly top three. We're on to number two now, which comes to the redistricting issue, which uh, we're getting a quick look. The Senate seats have not been chosen yet, but the House districts have been locked for now until the court, the inevitable court case uh, comes out. Uh, Brad, give us a, give us a, a, your view of what this means from what you're seeing so far. Well, as I said uh, said before we went into this segment, this is the way too early look uh, at the impact of redistricting on, uh, on on fiscal policy. But but I, I think I think the I think there is an impact that we can that we can see from it. Uh, going into redistricting, um, uh, in and you can look at this through various indicia. You can look at the Biden Trump uh, uh, results. You can look at uh, at previous election results. Um, and the analyst said, under the old boundaries, 17 firm Republican districts and eight firm 
uh, Democrat district. So there were 15 districts that didn't have have leaning strong leaning one way or the other. Right. 17 firm Republican and eight firm Democrats. Under the redistricting, uh, we now have 16 firm Republicans and 10 uh, strongly lean uh, Democrat uh, districts, uh, leaving uh, uh, 14 districts uh, uh, sort of bouncing between the two. So not a significant uh, change from the uh, 17 Republican, strongly lean Republican before we're down to 16, from the eight uh, firm Democrat uh, districts before we're up to 10, uh, and the and the difference is uh, uh, is 14 uh, is 15 in the old uh, undecided in the old uh, 14 in the new. That doesn't uh, uh, look like uh, a big shakeup uh, in the in the House at least, uh, and uh, it sort of depends on which uh, Senate uh, plan they come out with uh, during the day today. But if you look at having to get both bodies to agree on deep spending cuts, for example. Um, the House certainly uh, plays a, an equal role in that, and uh, and redistricting is telling us that there's not a big shakeup. The numbers are telling us there's not a big shakeup as a result of redistricting uh, in the uh, on the House side. Now that you know that can change. It can change over time as people move in, people move out. It can change over time as uh, as preferences uh, people's preferences change. It can change over time depending upon the candidates. There can be you know, better candidates for one party or the other uh, that can that can sway a district that uh, wasn't able to before. But just looking at the hard and fast uh, 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 numbers, the results uh, of, of, of elections and looking at how they play uh, when divided into the new district, it doesn't look like the legislature is changing much. And, and I think that means uh, that fiscal policy doesn't change much. We continue to have we continue to have the divides that we've had uh, in the uh, in the in the House, uh, at least in the House, uh, over uh, over time, over the last decade, uh, uh, the divisions uh, remain very close. Uh, power may swing from one party to another, uh, but it doesn't look like it uh, uh, like it significantly changes the divide. And when you're talking about things like needing constitutional amendments passed, um, you're going to need both both sides, uh, both the Republican and the Democrat side to, uh, to get the numbers, uh, to do that. Right. And, uh, and, 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 and we're staying, we're staying where we've been on the Senate Senate side. They decided yesterday, they decided all but Anchorage. Um, and, um, uh, they, they kept, they kept, uh, Gary Stevens district, uh, in place, for example, the, the district that Stevens has, has, uh, has won on in the past. There was a move to try to break that district up in a way that would have made the Republicans stronger in the district or traditional conservative Republicans stronger in that district. Um, uh, it wasn't adopted. And so outside of Anchorage, you, you they've tended to keep the districts in much the same um, uh, format uh, as they were before. Anchorage, um, <laughs> they were having a, a, a very difficult legal discussion uh, at the end of the redistricting board yesterday on the Senate side. Um, and Anchorage may go one way or the other. The Senate may, I mean, that, that may affect how the Senate looks in terms of the breakup. But again, you've got to have both the Senate and the House uh, to pass things like a constitutional amendment to constitu constitutionalize the PFD to establish a constitutional spending cap. Um, and with the House as, uh, as firmly, as, as, as divided going forward as it has been in the past, I think that brings you back to the Bipartisan uh, policy, fiscal policy working group is sort of the, is sort of the uh, uh, the way forward of trying to uh, bring these things together. Well, and I think the other thing, of course, that we throw into the mix now, on top of the redistricting, now is the you know the jungle primary, the ranked choice voting. You've got uh, you know people facing off against each other, McCarty and uh, uh, McCarty and Merrick. Merrick, and of course now. Um, um, uh, Jackson has thrown her hat into that ring. You got Jamie Allard, who's announced uh, for the empty district. We've got, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kirka and Eastman will be fighting it with each other, and you've got uh, uh, Jesse Sumner and uh, and Stephen Wright up there. I mean, it's going to make for well, it's going to be an unholy mess. It's going to be interesting to watch for sure. It is. It is, Michael. Um, and and certainly the personalities will have some influence on the process. But but fundamentally, I mean, you're 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 really are you looking at districts that are going to produce Democrats or or Democrat like Republicans? Or are you going to have districts that produce a, a strongly conservative 
uh, uh, Republicans. And I think I, it sort of, you know, leave the name out of it. But uh, I think what the what the numbers are telling us is that the redistricting is keeping the sort of division between Republican -like, Democrats, Republican like Democrats and uh, and uh, strong conservatives uh, uh, about the same as as where it was uh, where it's been in the last legislature. Equal split all the way around. Now, this is still has to be decided by the courts. Like I said, I think the last four out of the last six have been decided by the courts already. So no difference here. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, and and depending upon how Anchorage, the Anchorage Senate uh, districts land today, uh, we may definitely be headed toward court. One of the one of the proposals has a lot more problems from the standpoint of the uh, of, uh, of of dividing minority communities than another one does. And so, uh, if uh, if that one's adopted, we may definitely be headed to court. On the House side, uh, most people who have looked at it, most people who understand election law who have looked at it, said the really the one uh, difficult area is Cantwell, uh, maybe, that maybe Cantwell got put in the wrong district and maybe it needs to be uh, uh, changed around. But but the ones who have looked at it have, have largely said uh, that Anchorage uh, Anchorage was fair, that the rest of the state was fair, Fairbanks was fair. Um, and you have to keep in mind that the board approved the House plan four to one, uh, including uh, uh, Johnny Binkley, the chairman, and uh, and uh, 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 Paulette, uh, well, anyway, uh, <laughs> four of the members uh, right. approved it four to one. So, um, Bud Simpson, there we go. Uh, so, you, so that's, that's an indication that there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of question about the house, about the house. Plan. Well, let's move on to number three. Now that we've got a way early look at the redistricting and we'll finally talk about some good news, some good news out of PICA. Uh, one of our major projects on the slope. Uh, talk to me about that. So um, I've been very skeptical of the PICA project uh, because of oil search's inability to uh, get financing uh, for that project in large part, I think, because uh, they're a smaller player. Uh, Alaska is a, is a challenged environment, uh, even before going into climate change. Uh, Alaska has has is not uh, the option of choice for most people uh, where they're where they're concerned about uh, about climate change, um, and and I've and I've just had my doubts about Pika. Now Pika is owned fifty one percent by Oil Search uh, and forty nine percent by Repsol. Repsol is a European uh, based company, uh, formerly the Spanish national nationally owned company, uh, now privately owned or and partly owned by the government, but mostly privately owned. Um, and Repsol is one of those European companies that's had a very strong movement toward becoming active in uh, uh, in renewables and becoming active in uh, wind farms and solar panels and, and various other things, uh, becoming a uh, becoming an energy company as opposed to just an oil company. Uh, they did the the chairman recently did an interview with Energy Intelli Intelligence, one of the one of the industry sheets. Uh, and I was reading through it, and the first 75% of it is consistent with what you would see from a European. It was, we're moving to renewables. We're, you know, we're, we're going to hold on on oil investment. We're going to keep our oil arm. We're going to continue to sort of maintain it, but we're not we're not looking at expanding it much. And I thought, okay, well, if they ask about Alaska, we're, I know where this is going to go. And I was shot. I was very surprised when we got to the Alaska question. Uh, here's the question. You have a potential large project in Alaska. How does that project fit within a strategy to be low cost, low carbon and shorter cycle? Here's the answer. Uh, the North Slope is an area where infrastructure facilities pipelines are already there. So we are not entering in a frontier area. It's light oil. So there are fewer emissions in terms of carbon footprint than some other oils in the world. And the, admit, and the emissions footprint in, of our Alaska asset is going to be around 75 percent less than the current coverage for North Slope operations combining the facilities, infrastructure, and the quality of the oil. Here's the, here's the, the payoff uh, paragraph. The project is low cost and low greenhouse emission intensity, consistent with our commitment to align the company's portfolio with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. As I said before, a part of energy demand in 20 years is going to be covered by oil, and this oil has to be an oil of low break-even light oil and the lowest possible carbon footprint and carbon lowest possible footprint in carbon emission terms and avoiding in some way the new frontier frontier areas. Alaska is fitting with this view. Uh, it, it, uh, so 
Repsol, this European company that has a reputation for moving away from oil, moving into renewables, limiting its investment in oil, is endorsing um, its Alaska uh, project. Now, that doesn't mean PICA is ready to go. I mean, Oil Search, which owns 51%, has to find financing. That's proven to be a very difficult challenge for, uh, for PICA. But Repsol, who owns the other 49% and has a reputation for moving away from oil, from this comment, and, and again, they're an SEC regulated company, so they're not gonna be lying. From this comment, uh, seems to be uh, very strongly in support, of the, in support of the project. That's a good sign. Right, right. It, it, it would be a bad sign if uh, if your 49% partner was saying, yeah, we don't know. But <laughs> this but this 49% part, partner saying, let's go. I think that this is good. I mean, you you know, I, I picture you shocked right down to your socks when you read that part of the, uh, read that part of the review. Uh, that they were actually saying that Alaska is a good thing. Uh, were you expecting them to divest? What were you expecting them to do? I was expecting, yeah, well, they do have it up for sale. Let's be honest about this. They do have at least a portion of it up for sale. Oil Search is trying to sell, I think, uh, a third of their interest or maybe a quarter of their interest. Repsol wants to sell uh, the same percentage uh, of theirs. So, you know, there is some bit of salesmanship going on here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I've expected them to uh, to look uh, for an opportunity to get out of of this project. Uh, maybe not unlike the same way that Exxon's dealing with Point Thompson. You know, first give up operatorship, which Repsol has. Oil Oil Search is the operator, and then slowly slide away, looking for a for a purchaser. Sort of what BP did with uh, uh, with uh, with Hillcorp. Uh, the fact that that there was not a, a hint. Of, uh, of we want out of this, uh, or that it's inconsistent with our long-term plan, or that you know, like like ten other projects that they've got, you know, we're, we're open to the first bidder. Uh, the fact that there wasn't a hint of that, I think, is uh, is 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 very surprising. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, final thoughts here, Brad. We got about uh, three and a half minutes or so here, so I'll just open up the floor. Anything that didn't make it to the top three that you think are still uh, still important for today? Well, Michael, I want to go back. I, I think what's important for today is is how we're setting up for the uh, for the next regular session, um, and and there is going to be uh, uh, there is going. I, I mean. The oil prices are telling us and the oil futures market is telling us there is going to be uh, additional oil revenues, substantial additional oil revenues uh, over and above what uh, was predicted in the spring forecast and, and what the legislature based, uh, based their budget on. Um, I think it's important that, that people tell their the constituents, tell their representatives and, and talk about publicly using that windfall first, that, 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 that excess first and foremost to refill the PFD. I mean, it's not, it's not even, we're not even at POMV 5050 with the current PMV. The current, the POMV 5050 would be about $2,300. We've only done an $1,100 uh, PFD to this point. Um, so I think, I think talking publicly about, about living up to the commitment to, to Alaskans, to Alaska families uh, is a very important thing. And I don't think that should wait until uh, the session starts. I think people ought to be uh, doing it now, contacting their representatives uh, and and doing it now. Otherwise, I mean, we've seen what the lobbyists are doing. The lobbyists are coming in uh, and already saying, oh, well, let's do it for oil tax credits and let's do it for school bond reimbursement. Let's do it. all the things that the legislature decided last spring they didn't need to do. The lobbyists are now coming in and say, oh, you need to spend it on this and you need to spend it on that. And I think it's it's in, it's incumbent on constituents who want to use that money to at least get us back to POMB 5050. I think it's incumbent on constituents to counter that by, by as the lobbyists are doing early and often with, uh, with their representatives to, uh, to push using that money for, uh, for uh, the PFD. Exactly. And of course, pushing the idea again of the distributional model and what, it, what the effects are on Alaskans and everything else. Uh, I mean, re reading uh, Andreessen's, uh, you know, uh, screed there on everything that they want to spend it on. It's like a laundry list of, uh, of programs that have already been cut back. I mean, this is all things that we, I mean, it's just astonishing. Wait, we just decided we could live without all of this stuff. And you're saying, no, that's the first thing we need to spend it all on. Exactly. I mean, we, we went through that debate in the spring. We decided to cut those things in the spring that they weren't they, they weren't must-haves. 
and 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 to even pay for the little for the for the stuff we did do, we had to cut the PFD in half, more than half, from the from the POMV fifty fifty. Now that we've got now that now that we're going to have additional money, we ought to live up to our to our commitment to Alaskans. If we already decided we didn't need to spend it on we didn't need to spend it on those things on government spending things, uh, we ought to stick with that and say, okay, the additional money should be going to Alaska families the way it was the way it's promised by at least uh, POMV uh, POMV fifty fifty. I, that that battle to me is is really. Uh, the battle for the future. I mean, if we can't get the legislature to take additional revenues um, uh, and put it at least up to POMV 5050, I think the long-term prospects of getting the PFD restored, even to POMV 50 or, or anything above the trivial, trivial amounts that we're getting now, getting the PFD restored long-term is is suspect. I, I I think this battle next year about how to deal with these additional revenues is uh is uh, is going to tell us a lot about where we're headed in the future. Brad, how do people find out more about you? Where do they go? How do they follow what you're doing? Easiest way is to go, if you're on Facebook, go to the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook uh, page uh, and uh, and like it, and you'll see all of the stuff we're publishing. We also have a website, AK4FORSB, uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, AK4SB, and you can find it there. We're also on Twitter. Uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. So there's a number of ways, but everything goes through the uh, Facebook page at one one time or another. So if you're on Facebook, you can use that as a hub to stay current with us. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. As always, a pleasure to speak with you, and we look forward to uh, visiting again next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. And hopefully the uh, camera held up throughout the entire oh, uh, entire discussion. Did, did good today. I didn't have to swap you out once, so it was all good. It's all good <laughs> stuff. Thank you, Brad. Right, Appreciate good. it. Good to talk with you. Thanks for being part of it today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.